Uh, now, this may not be exactly what you're expecting, but I think it'll be interesting at any rate, because part of what I'm going to do is go through my own experience, the things that have uh, influenced and impacted me and, and led me to the conclusions that I have about how we should understand Ellen White today. And um, and so eventually I'll get to a, an actual fundamental belief statement that we should uh, well, that we should um, use. Now, it turns out that within the Adventist church, we have people on the far left and on the far right. On the far left, we have folks like uh, Russell, Russell and Colin Stanley, who wrote this book, The Greatest of All the Prophets. This is Ellen White. How in the world, I don't even remember reading how in the world they uh, argued that she was the greatest of all, all the prophets. But never mind that. that. They're on the very, very, very far right, or what we consider the far right. Now, on the far left, well, never that, that they're on the very, very, very far right, or what we consider the far right. Now, on the far left, well, never that, that they're on the very. Okay, now I heard myself repeated, but anyway, on the on the uh, far left, in fact, all uh, often clear outside the church, we have people who uh, think Ellen White is a total fraud. And uh, but uh, in a sense, they haven't left the church. And it reminds me of the words from the Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And these people are just as energetic trying to convert all of us that Ellen White was a fraud as they once were trying to convince us that uh, Jesus was coming very soon. Now, I must say this, that I recently got hold of this Oxford Handbook of Seventh-day Adventism, a 600-plus page book that costs $175. I, I borrowed a copy. Um, and there are lots of things in there that may change my views. So uh, this is my views as of today. Now, I want to talk about uh, what has shaped my views. I grew up uh, in the hills outside of Placerville, California. This is what downtown Placerville looked like, at least uh, about the time I was born, I suppose. And I used to come in here, and uh, over here on the right is the theater, and there was a barber shop right next to the theater. And the uh, barber there, once while he was cutting my hair, really hurt my feelings. He said, your hair is just like barbed wire. Oh, well, you shouldn't say that to a little boy. Okay, well, anyway, here's the uh, here's the cabin that I first uh, uh, became aware of uh, living in. That's me sitting on the porch, my mother looking out there. And that house, or that cabin, is is this part of this house, which is still there today. And in fact, this the second story addition was added while we were still living there. If you go on Google uh, maps and use the screen level view, you can see the house is still there and still occupied. My father and my uncle built a house, and uh, in my day, in the foreground here was a beautiful, huge oak tree with a long limb that came down near the ground so that we could all sit on it and bounce up and down. This is where I first got my impressions of Ellen White, and that was from my mother, Marguerite Ruckel uh, Graybill. And my mother was a, a pianist, and she taught me piano and taught others piano. And uh, the two uh, young people in the picture are my cousins, who later went to Newbury Park Academy, and I followed them there. But uh, my mother was a believer in Ellen White, and uh, uh, she uh, followed her teachings in, in most ways. My grandmother, however, Mabel Ruckel, my mother's mother, grew up in uh, Michigan. Um, at the time of the Kellogg controversy, and she and her family, although they remained faithful Adventists, they sided with Kellogg and came to believe that Ellen White was not a true prophet. And then they moved out to Baldwin Park, California, and my grandmother was playing the piano for the Seventh-day Adventist church there in Baldwin Park. 
until they discovered that she did not believe in Ellen White. Oh, oh my goodness, how shall we discipline her? Oh, we will not allow her to play the piano in our church anymore. You can't play the piano in our church if you don't believe in Ellen White. So this is my, my first hint that maybe there was some uh, uh, problem with uh, whether or not you believed in Ellen White. Now, my mother's uh, interest in music, uh, I followed on in her case, and I've written a lot about early Advent hymns and early Advent music. And in fact, I was on the committee that uh, created the current Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, and I wrote the introduction to that hymnal. So if you ever want to read something, if the sermon is particularly boring, just look at the introduction to the hymnal. But here's where my mother got her instructions, testimonies for the church. Oh, yes. And a couple of things that she derived from that. One thing, I don't know if it was in testimonies or where she got the idea, but she got the idea that in the time of trouble, when we had to flee to the rocks and the mountains, we would not have any Bibles with us. But if we had memorized the first Psalm, the 19th Psalm, the 23rd Psalm, the 46th Psalm, and we had memorized those Psalms, we could, uh, we could survive the time of trouble. So I memorized them, sure enough. She also derived from Ellen White the idea that you should not send your children to school too early. And so I was not allowed to go to school until I was eight years old, much to my annoyance. And then I started at the Camino Placerville Junior Academy in 1953. That's how I looked in my uh, T-shirt at that time. Um my mother, uh, uh, shortly after that, my parents divorced. My mother went to PUC. She got a teaching credential, and uh, we ended up in uh, uh, her first school was in Mount Shasta. This was the school where she taught. I visited years later. I used to sit in that classroom and draw pictures of Mount Shasta while I was uh, supposed to be studying. Anyway, um, uh, I, my parents were divorced, and my dad was living in Sacramento, and I was feeling so sorry for him living there all alone that my mother just up, she sometimes was impulsive, my mother just up and sent me to Sacramento to stay with my dad. Well, when I was with my dad, he would take me to Sutter's Fort, and that's where I acquired my interest in history. Not Adventist history at that time, but Sutter's Fort it was fascinating to me. So I got an interest in history from my dad and also an interest in poetry from him since he used to recite poems to me. Okay, then after, after I graduated from uh, uh, elementary school in various places, I ended up at Newbury Park Academy. That was a very interesting experience and a very wholesome one. I uh, became editor of the student newspaper. In fact, uh, just recently looking at this 1961, I see I did other things too. It says here that I, I was uh, the a, a temperance club leader, an MV leader, a member of the student council, and he plans to enroll in La Sierra College next year. Sure enough. Okay, so learn more about my background. My mentor and my best friend at at uh, Newbury Park was Don Yost. He and his wife were teaching there at that time, and he was my advisor on the student newspaper. Now, Don Yost later became the first editor of Insight Magazine, and I wrote a good deal of articles for Insight Magazine, many of them about Ellen White, the, the one in 20 club about her statement, not, not one in 20, you know, uh, ab about how the Ministry of Healing was formed, about Canwright's confrontation with Loughborough in Healdsburg, about Ellen White in the automobile, the courtship of Ellen White. And in fact, I am now working on what I'm calling Life Works in Adventist History. I'm working on uh, volume four now, but uh, I'm going to post these this will include all the articles that I've written, all the book chapters that I've written that, that I think are at all interesting and significant, and I'm going to post all of those on uh, academia.edu, where you can go and download them uh, for free. So that'll come along later, and I'll let you know when, that's, uh, when that starts to be ready. Now, uh, another thing that I did at uh, Newberry was to enter these temperance oratorical contests and became interested in public speaking. 
And I won the prize there with my oration, I am a cigarette. Then I went on to uh, La Sierra College. Now, my mother had attended La Sierra College. Here she is in the front row right here. This is my mom. But when she came to La Sierra College, like her mother, she didn't believe Ellen White was a true prophet. Then she had what seems to me a very strange experience. She read a book that Ellen White was, I was going to say wrote, was behind. And this book persuaded her that Ellen White was a true prophet. What was the book? Messages to Young People. Go figure. When I was a teen, if there was any book to persuade me that Ellen White was not a true prophet, it would have been Messages to Young People. But my mother found something there that uh, moved her. So at La Sierra, I was editor of the student newspaper again, and uh, John Butler, uh, he's over on the right here, but I, I think you're, you're, he may not show, but Rick Rice was here. They wrote for me the religion columns. And we had uh, a teacher there at uh, the Taught the Spirit of Prophecy course, uh, J.C. Hostler, and he used this book, A Prophet Among You. And I must say that uh, J.C. Hostler's style and his strict and uh, marginally fanatical belief in Ellen White did not endear me to Ellen White at all. However, we had other professors at La Sierra. We had Dan Cotton, uh, Wilbur Alexander, Walter Speck, Royal Sage, and my favorite of all was Fritz Guy. There he is when he was just an instructor in religion, and there he is in later life. And Fritz was still with us when we formed the, the Dead Prophets Society. And we made ourselves a, 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 a coffee cup, and some of us would drink coffee during our meetings. Now, in case that's a problem for you, here's a, here's a website where you can go and learn the health benefits of coffee. But anyway... Here's one of our early meetings when Fritz was still with us, and I noticed that I'm the only one drinking coffee. John is drinking water, and maybe Gil is drinking water too. But anyway, uh, we talked about Ellen White, and we called ourselves the Dead Prophet Society, uh, inspired by Robin Williams' movie, The Dead Poet Society. Here this teacher was trying to show his students that although these poets were dead, they were still relevant and still could be inspirational and helpful in their lives today. And so that was what we wanted to do with the Dead Poet, Prophet Society, is, is to show and to learn how to make Ellen White relevant and useful for us today. Now, uh, while I was, uh, I went on, of course, from, uh, from La Sierra to the seminary at Andrews, and when I was there, I met my wife, Gerta Bacher, Gray Bill, uh, she had been come there to work at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And uh, after we married, uh, since she was still a Danish citizen, uh, we were able to buy an apartment in Denmark, and we have visited Denmark every summer ever since then. And that led me to write an article about Ellen White in Copenhagen. Now, also when I was at Andrews, I got into my first real taste of controversy when I wrote a article, an article for the student newspaper called Sign Watching Produces Apathy. And the folks at Southern Missionary College, probably to show what heretics we were at Andrews, they reprinted my whole article. And Robert Pearson was very upset by it, and he wrote a letter to Richard Hamill, let's look at let's look at his letter. Here's here's the letter that Pearson wrote to Hamill, and uh, he said, uh, "Now let me see if I can move this out of the way." Okay, there. He said, "Some of us, Elder Elder Hamill, have really been distressed over this." This is what uh, Robert Pearson said about my article. Well, then later Pearson visited the campus and called me in. And uh, I had a visit with him, and we talked. I don't remember what we he said or I said, except for the very last thing that he said to me. At the very end, he said, well, Brother Graybell, some of us still believe Jesus is coming very soon. That was 1966. Okay. Also, while I was at Andrews, I uh, uh, continued my interest in race relations, and I wrote this book, uh, Ellen G. White and Church Race Relations. 
And that was at a time when the white estate really, uh, and Ellen White was under criticism for possible racist views. And so uh, since I had done good research and everything, Arthur White uh, invited me to come to the white estate and help him do the research for the six volume biography of Ellen White. So I spent 13 years at the Ellen White estate. While I was there, I was ordained. E.E. E. Cleveland and Neil Wilson were there. Uh, Arthur White was there, Gordon Hyde. Uh, Robert Pearson signed my certificate as well. And ironically, on that same platform, on that same evening, and during that same ordination service, Ed Zinke was also ordained. So there you have it, the left and the right. Ed Zinke ended up in the Biblical Research Institute, and uh, I ended up out here uh, le lecturing this uh, this group on uh, Adventists today. So there I was in the White Estate with access to all the letters and manuscripts and all the handwritten materials and all the, even in those days we had a Z file, so I could read the Z file if I wanted to. And uh, I worked with Arthur White there for 13 years. As time went on and I learned more and more, I got more and more uh, uncomfortable with some of Arthur White's interpretations and views. And so when I went to Johns Hopkins to get my PhD to study American uh, religious history uh, and to write my dissertation, I foolishly did not even consult with my colleagues at the White Estate about my dissertation. And so that came out in 1983, and I had uh, specifically instructed University Microfilms not to sell any copies of it until I had a chance to revise it because I knew it would be controversial in its original form. But before they could get their mechanism, uh, Doug Hackelman ordered a copy and got a copy and put a note in, uh, in uh, Adventist Currents. And very soon the White Estate knew all about it and I was in big trouble. Well, after all, I must say two things about my doctoral dissertation. One is that when my mother read my doctoral dissertation, in spite of all the criticism, she said, now I feel like Ellen White could have been my friend. And that was probably the best thing anybody said to me about my doctoral dissertation. And now, of course, the whole doctoral dissertation is published by Oak and Acorn. You can buy it. So after all the controversy back then, it's not all subsided. Well, what, what was wrong with the dissertation? For one thing, we had recently received these letters from Lucinda Hall, uh, the letters that Ellen White wrote to Lucinda Hall. And Lucinda was such a good friend of Ellen White's that she confided in her some of the details of her, uh, her conflicts with uh, James White. In fact, she mentioned how James White had told her, keep your head on your own shoulders. And uh, I dropped that into my dissertation. Well, that was against white estate policy. You were not supposed to use anything unless it was released by the Board of Trustees. So I violated the policy. And as a result, I was reassigned from the white estate. I was never fired by the white estate. I was reassigned. And the first reassignment was to help Dick Schwartz write the denominational history textbook, Light Bearers to the Remnant. And shortly after that, I went to the Columbia Union, became editor of the Columbia Union Visitor for a number of years. Well, as you know, during those years, it wasn't just um, me that was in trouble. Uh, Ron Numbers published his book, uh, Prophetess of Health. Walter Ray published his book, The White Lie. But even at the White Estate, we were doing research on Ellen White's use of sources. And Donald John, uh, uh, no, Warren, not Donald, Warren John and, and Tim Poirier and I published a study of her use of Melville. And over the year, and then, you know, Don McAdams wrote his uh, paper, which was only recently published. And I wrote a book, Visions and Revisions. And over the years, I've written a number of articles which also contributed to this uh, ferment uh, over the last 50 years that has led many of us to feel like we need a new approach to Ellen White. I wrote about the dream life of Ellen White. I wrote, Are All Ellen White's Writings Inspired? I wrote, J. N. Loughborough, historian, and showed why he was not a reliable historian. I wrote about the Salamanca vision and the Salamanca diaries. I wrote about the Apocrypha 
Recently, I published Israel Damon's co-defendant, and I've written about Ellen White's uh, Breathless Visions. Um, now, let's get to the business of uh, fundamental beliefs. Early Adventists were dead set against creeds. And so the first time anything about our... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm getting out of order here. Getting back to the controversies about Ellen White. The early controversy should not have been about plagiarism at all. That was not the problem. This was the problem. Ellen White had published in 1882, and it was used after that in many, many of her books. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision. Now, the problem is that that statement was, in a sense, only half true. Uh, it is true that she didn't merely express her own ideas. But she expressed the ideas that she had derived from others, and they were not all what God had opened before her in vision, or if he opened it to her in vision, she had already read it in the books before she dreamed about it. So that led, has led me, finally, to ask the following question. Could not Ellen White have written all she did on the basis of what she had read, conversations she shared, sermons she heard, and her own deeply spiritual insight. Is there anything in her writings that could not have been derived from these sources? Well, some say, what about the prescience? What about these times when she stood up in a meeting and she pointed out somebody she had never met before and revealed their secret sins that God had re uh, shown to her, and so on? I have not had an opportunity to carefully study all these uh, claims of prescience. I suspect that most of them are based on hearsay evidence. Not only that, but if I had been in a meeting and Ellen White had pointed, looked around and said, you there in the dark hair sitting on the aisle, uh, I don't know your name, I've never met you before, that the Lord has revealed to me that you're a selfish hypocrite. I would have said to myself, oh my goodness, Lord must have revealed that to her, because I certainly am a selfish hypocrite. But the fact of the matter is, if she'd thrown a dart, she would have hit a selfish, hip selfish hypocrite. So I want to find out more about those prescient things. But in her teachings and her books and everything other than these prescient things, it seems to me that you could say that she could have written all of it without a, a, a direct uh, divine vision. Now, we also have in the Adventist church something I call a view of, of what I call functional inerrancy, because few would claim that Ellen White's writings are inerrant, but many deny that any alleged error is, in fact, an error. So functionally, they are inerrantists, because no matter what you what you point to and say that cannot be scientifically or historically or biblically correct, no matter what you point, they'll always find some reason to say that's not an error, that's not a mistake, and, and so on. So functionally, uh, there is this uh, inerrancy on all but the most trivial and insignificant details. Now, Let's go on with our fundamental beliefs things. We have these books, Seventh-day Adventist Belief, and this belief, and this book is all about the fundamental beliefs and commentary on the fundamental beliefs. But you know, our fundamental beliefs are not what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Our fundamental beliefs are what a small group of church leaders and selected scholars drafted and got a general conference uh, session to vote. If we want to know what Seventh-day Adventists believe, we might well wait for Ron Lawson's report. If you go to sda-global.org, you can keep track of his work. Since 1984, Ron Lawson has interviewed over 4,500 Adventists in 60 countries, learned more about this rich data source, and explored the findings from independent research projects about the global Adventist church. He's going to publish at least four volumes of these results, and they will be most interesting. 
But of course, the people who don't like what he found will say what J.D. Vance says about the surveys that show Tama, uh, Kamala Harris is ahead of, of well, he said, oh, well, the surveys are biased. They just talk to people that they wanted to and ask questions that they wanted to ask. Anyway, our very first statement of fundamental beliefs was called a Declaration of Fundamental Principles, published in 1872. Uriah Smith did not sign his name to it, but later repetition of it uh, attributed it to him. And in the article about spiritual gifts, there was not one mention made of Ellen White or the Remnant Church. Not one mention made of Ellen White or the Remnant Church. And in fact, portions of that statement continued to be published in Adventist yearbooks and uh, other sources as our belief about the gift of prophecy clear down until the 1950s. And in fact, uh, these early statements were written primarily with the public in mind, not internally. They were not internal conversations. There was a public in mind. And we were anxious to affirm that spiritual gifts were perpetual, but we were not anxious to claim that we had the gift of prophecy because it would make us look like a cult. So what happened in 1950 that started to change things? Well, Raymond Cottrell had happened. Cottrell served as a founding secretary of and the primary advocate of the Biblical Research Fellowship, the first professional association of Adventist Bible scholars. It was formed in 1943, the year before I was born. The fellowship continued until 1952 when it was disbanded due to conflicts with General Conference President William Henry Branson over biblical interpretation, particularly the identity of the King of the North in Daniel 11, and over the appropriate of, um, let's see if I can see what this is here, over uh, of, uh, yeah, there we go, um, Adventist scholars functioning without administrative oversight of the General Conference. So here we have Bible scholars studying the Bible alone, coming to understand who the King of the North was in Daniel 11, but lo and behold, their conclusion differed from Ellen White's conclusion. So now our fundamental beliefs started to be directed toward internal concerns to try to restrain and to discipline scholars like Cottrell and his associates. And so in the 1950 revision, we had these additions, that the gift of the spirit of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church, the church recognizes that this gift is a manifest, was manifest in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Now, I want you to recognize that the term, quote unquote, remnant church, nor the name Ellen G. White, never appears in the Bible. So now we're bringing things into our fundamental beliefs that are above and beyond what the Bible itself says. Okay, so that was 1950. Now, in 1980, there was a further revision in which Ellen White was said to uh, that her writings are continuing an authoritative source of truth. Authoritative source of truth. Notice that word, authoritative. Ted Wilson was a delegate to that general conference. His father was chairing the meeting when he stood up to speak to this question of authority. So what did he say? He said, at the risk of seeming somewhat simplistic, may I suggest that the real crux of the matter in this, as well as in other items, is whether Ellen White, in the spirit of prophecy, can really be considered an authoritative commentary on Scripture. I would like to state that I believe that the spirit of prophecy is as applicable in 1980 as it ever has been, and that Ellen White can be considered an authoritative commentary on Scripture that she's uh, and that she is God's servant for the last days. Now, once you have an authoritative commentary, and uh, this commentary and this interpretation of the Bible is the supreme authority. So once you have Ellen White described as authoritative, and you give her the ability to override all science, all history, all biblical interpretation, and she becomes the ultimate basis 
of our doctrine. Now, at that same general conference session, I was a, a delegate, and I drafted uh, what was adopted as a preamble. And this is the way it, I, adopt, I presented it and the way it was uh, edited. Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teaching of Holy Scriptures. These beliefs as set forth here constitute the Church's understanding and expression of the teaching of Scripture, and revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the Church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of the Bible, Bible truth or finds better language in which to express <coughs> the teachings of God's Holy Word. So my draft referred to our current best understanding. That was changed to simply understanding. My draft said it can and should be revised. That was changed to revisions may be expected. And they also added, at a general conference session, of course, and I had talked about a, needing a better understanding, and they said, well, perhaps we could get a fuller understanding. Now, it seems like an innocuous thing to say, and most people have not found any problem with it, but on the far right wing of the, of the church, there was a problem. And sure enough, in the Standish Brothers book, The 28 Fundamentals of Apostasy proclaimed in silence. There's a chapter 11 on the preamble. Over the years, one of the most quoted aspects of the 27 fundamental beliefs has been the portion that appears in none of the 27 articles. It is the preamble, unofficially known as the Graybill Preamble because it initially drafted and proposed by Dr. Ronald Graybill. I don't know if anybody ever referred to it as the Graybill Preamble other, uh, other than Stamish. But he says, you know, that is, as written, it is difficult to take issue, but as used by the liberal elements of our church, it has become a snare. It has been largely interpreted to mean in liberal circles that when the laity and leadership have lost their hold on truth, the 27 fundamentals are ripe for alterations, which reflect more openly the tenets of the new theology, which came not from inspiration, but from the fallen churches of Babylon, especially those of evangelical Protestantism. Okay, now, the 19, 2015 General Conference session further revised, further revised the fundamental belief on the gift of prophecy, and instead of saying uh, authoritative source of truth, it said that Ellen White speaks with prophetic authority. And uh, I, nobody gives a definitive definition of what all that means, but as I look at the way it, Ellen White is used by the literal inerrantists, I, uh, or by the functional inerrantists, it, it seems to me that uh, in many people's minds, this word authoritative, authoritative could be interpreted as inerrant. Okay, so what shall we propose as a new statement of fundamental beliefs? Or let me just say, this will be my statement of fundamental. I don't have any illusion this will ever be adopted by a general conference in session. Not at all. But I want to be able to say something about Ellen White that can be fundamental in my belief and others who share my views. The scripture test, scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. We believe this gift was manifest in the ministry of Ellen White. Now, we're leaving out the stuff about the uh, remnant church. We're leaving out the stuff about authoritative and simply say her writings provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. I think I would add a little bit more to this. <clears throat> Something that came in Uriah Smith's first pamphlet on our beliefs, and that is this. When, before he started to list our fundamental principles, he said, in presenting to the public this synopsis of our faith, we wish it to have it distinctly understood that we have no articles of faith, creed, or discipline aside from the Bible. We do not put forth this as having any authority with our people, nor is it designed to secure uniformity among them. Now, if all of our statements of fundamental beliefs had re included that statement, we would have a better 
uh, defense against saying uh, uh, that our our fundamental beliefs are in fact a creed. Okay, so that it comes to that that ends my um, uh, presentation, and uh, I am. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to let you folks comment and uh, discuss. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. That was quite interesting. Uh, and to everyone else, those who've been in the chat and the rest of you online, it is time for you to raise your hands and join the conversation. Just as a reminder, that should be somewhere to the bottom right of your screen. If you're not seeing it, and if you click on more, there it should be one of the options there for you to raise your virtual hand. Also, just as a reminder, several of you are online as just iPhone or Zoom user. So we're going to ask you so that we know who you are and we can all feel welcome that you use your, your real name so we can refer to you uh, when you join the conversation. All right. So, Lauren, you were... Very quick to raise your hand, uh, so you get to ask the first question. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much, Ron. This was fascinating. I, I didn't know you were going to do this as a as a sort of autobiography, but I thought it worked out really well to put it in that that setting. Um, Ron, I, I I was at the seminary uh, a little bit after you. I was there during the era when. The uh, the queen of uh, Ellen White was uh, Mrs. Jemison, and uh, she kind of ran things there. Pretty pretty strong personality. Those of you who who remember her or knew her, um, and this was the era when uh, when when if you wanted to, you could read a lot of things in Ellen White, but if you wanted to cite them anywhere. You had to put in a formal request, and they would vote it. And uh, I think I I did for a paper or something. Although when I look back at it now, I don't think what I suggested that they release was was anything earth shaking. But I just wanted to do it. And I remember I I had to chuck a little bit your reference to the Z file. For some reasons, uh, Mrs. Jemison liked us. Uh, she even invited us over to her house, and. Uh, and I remember her telling us, talking about how thoroughly she protected the Z file. So uh, I'm going to start with this question, Ron. What was in that Z file? Is it still is it still all thoroughly confidential, confidential and locked up? Uh, why were things put into the Z file? Um, my, um, you know, I'm 80 years old now and my memory is not always perfect, but, uh, I, I seem to recall that the Z file was, had things that were very, of a very personal nature. And, uh, at the time, some of the people who had received these testimonies, uh, were still alive. And so they were just protecting the personal privacy of, uh, various individuals. And there was a time, and I don't remember the exact date, but there was a time when, uh, the Z file was simply dispersed, and it was, all those the, all those letters were put into the regular file. Okay. All right. So uh, my second question is this, and I thought about it, uh, and I've wondered this many times through the years. The testimonies, at least some of them, appear to have been written to individuals, uh, and I and I it always seemed to me if if I suddenly picked up a book and and saw oh, here's a letter that about very personal things that Ellen White wrote to me, and now it's published in print, even if they don't have my name on it. I wonder, do, do we have any, any evidence that there are people who saw, who, who got her letters or saw them published and said, I want nothing to do with these people. They're, they're, there's no, no confidentiality here. There's uh, this, this lady lashes out with these accusations and then without knowing me or knowing whether they're true, uh, puts them in a book. Do, you, do we have any understanding of people's reactions to these very personal testimonies? Well, uh, I, I don't recollect. And some of the, some of the other uh, 
uh, Ellen White scholars who are actually on today may be able to answer your question better better than me. Um, I suppose it could be that some people uh, said, uh, I'm, uh, I don't like it that she published that letter. I'm afraid too many of uh, people I know will recognize that it was something written to me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I, I really don't know. Kevin Morgan is here, and I know he he knows a lot a lot of the background here too. He had his hand up, but now he doesn't. Kevin, don't go away. We we do want you to join the the presentation, the uh, discussion here. Thank you very much, Ron. All right, thanks, Lauren, for getting us started. Uh, now, Bjorn, uh, it is time for you to join the conversation. Thanks, Cherry Ann. And thank you very, very much for the presentation. I I, uh, I was very intrigued, uh, partly because my dad um, my dad worked for the White Estate for a, at least a couple decades, and the the final decade. I mean, he's he's you know definitely retired now, but the final decade that this Z file, I think he called it the X file. But um, so part of his job was to um, was to annotate the unpublished letters of Ellen White, so stuff that the the White Estate had had not been willing or hadn't gotten to to publishing yet. They they I guess there was some kind of policy change within the White Estate. They were they were just going to publish everything, and so they wanted to they wanted to annotate the you know these letters so that there was some context around them. Uh, and my dad, I mean, I've had several conversations with him. He's he always vigorously defends Ellen White. So I, I'm wondering from 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 your your perspective, um, is there because I, I, I still feel like like I have never understood why the fact that she by modern standards plagiarized, why that completely discredits her in some people's minds. Like um that it, that wasn't the law back then. Um I mean we have biblical examples of biblical writers doing it. Uh, it, it just it, we're, we're applying a modern standard to to clearly something that that was a different practice back then. Um, the, the fact that you know she she claims to be inspired, but clearly used uh, ideas or even articulations of other people. To me, I mean, if you're if you're looking if you're thinking in terms of thought inspiration as opposed to like every word was uttered by God, it, it makes sense that wh why couldn't she borrow from from sources? Like I, I you know if it, if it wasn't the the law back then to not do that. Um, do you do you feel that these you know those kinds of accusations actually discredit her, or is there a place to say that? I mean, she is a treasure. She's like the grandma of Adventism. She should be celebrated, and you know, with, with just a realistic understanding that some of the stuff she wrote wasn't inspired, and some of it was, and we're never going to know what what is what. I mean, let, let's just be realistic about that. We're going to disagree until the second coming about all that. And let's just relax a little bit and and understand that she's a gift, but we're going to disagree about exactly how how to apply that gift. Like I I I am so sick of all the animosity and the anger and the disillusionment. I'm like, "Come on, she was a human, and I believe she was inspired in some ways, and she did some good things. But wh why do we have to put this sort of infallibility sort of uh, stamp on her and have her live up to that all the time? Yeah, well, uh, that, there's a lot of uh, very helpful and intelligent discussion about what inspiration means and what it should mean for us today. And I'm looking forward to the portions of this new uh, Oxford handbook uh, to read about what those uh, scholars are, are saying on that. I um, uh, do want to mention uh, an observation of my friend uh, John Butler. He said, listen, we read the Psalms that David wrote, and we believe they are inspired, and we are inspired by them. But if Ellen White had ever done the things that David did in his life, my goodness, she would be totally discredited. Ellen White Absolutely. didn't. Ellen White didn't have an uh, an affair with S. N. Haskell and and uh, arranged to have his wife murdered, and yet we read David and, and we're blessed by it. So you know, prophets are people, but they're inspired, and we need to be inspired by them too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a generous way to look at it in in a positive sense. 
All right, thanks. Thanks, Bjorn. Uh, I have a, a couple of thoughts on that, but I'm going to hold on to them for now. Oh, uh, and Carmen, I invite you to join the conversation. Hi, Ron. Um, thank you so much. I've enjoyed uh, the presentation as I've enjoyed, um, sorry <laughs> that I shouted at first. There was some noise over here. Um, I've enjoyed many of your books and articles. I just want to understand, because I did look at um, the Ellen White Estate website in a couple of different places this past week, and the statements about what is available at this point, uh, the statements are written in a way that you can't quite claim that you understand them as saying everything is released or everything's available. Some of it sounds like, well, it's the published things. And we have changed some of the policies, even though they say they had a sacred responsibility to control the content because spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. Um, so what is released? And does that mean released at the Ellen White study centers or online? Can you clarify that? Oh, again, you know, I wish I were up to speed on all of this, but as I, when I think about the White Estate and some anything that I might want to get from the White Estate, it seems to me that uh, virtually everything I would want or need are, uh, are uh, online, published or online, and so on. But I am very interested in the handwritten material. I like to see exactly how her literary assistants uh, uh, um, transcribed what she wrote and how they edited it, and so on. And the fact of the matter is that I... I can see the handwritten material, but I need to go to the White Estate headquarters there in Silver Spring, and I need to go into the vault there. I need to arrange ahead of time for that appointment. And if I want anything from that, then that will require uh, board approval. But uh, virtually everything else is is uh, is available, and you know with this with this online search uh, capability, you can you can find all kinds of things. Whenever I look up, uh, whenever I look up something, for instance, that statement about uh, I do not write one article for the paper, expressing merely my own ideas. I went to the White Estate. Uh, 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 search uh, function, and I put in the phrase that I wanted, and I saw that it appears in dozens of books, but I just kept searching until I found the very first instance when it was published, and it was in 1882, and then I went to my my copy of that actual thing, and that's where that's uh, where I I quoted it from. So it's it's just it's just uh, it's just uh, very helpful. It's it's, it's only the um, it's uh, all, only the uh, the handwritten material that requires a special visit and special permission, as far as I understand. So the things that are available, and I have found many things online. They are as come down to us through her literary assistants and they're they're final editions of these things if we can't if it's not the original manuscripts that we can see right well i i guess you could say that what happened is ellen white wrote these things by hand her literary assistants uh, early on, before typewriters came into use, they, they copied them by hand, and they became adept at reading her handwriting, which, you know, when she was under stress or writing rapidly, it would be hard for some of us to read. And so they put it in proper gra grammatical shape. And then uh, later, they gathered those, th those things together. They took excerpts from different letters in different places and put them together in articles and books. Uh, but it's that original handwritten stuff. And you don't, uh, uh, 
um, uh, uh, Kevin Morgan and I uh, have acquired, and many of it, many of these things have been published here and there, but we have acquired quite a large collection of Ellen White handwritten materials, and we have transcribed them ourselves, line for line and word for word, and we check each other's work, and so on and so forth. And we don't find we don't find uh, much startling. Uh, you know, I think the 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 most troublesome thing is something that I've already written about extensively, and that was about the uh, the diary entries about the Salamanca vision. But um, uh, and and uh, Kevin and I, uh, I, I'm not sure that we would be uh, uh, authorized to publish our transcriptions <laughs> of these things. But but uh, and and let me say this too: I'm afraid that I should admit that not every handwritten material that uh, Kevin and I work on are something that has been published already in a book or something. <laughs> Some of it were uh, things that were that, that I scanned when I was at the White Estate, and uh, I probably should be careful about those. Sometimes, you know, I just go into a White Estate Visitor Center, and there I see under glass, I see a handwritten document, and I, and I take my phone and take a picture of it. So we collect everything we can, and I don't know, maybe uh, Kevin and I ought to write a jo joint article and uh, reflect on what can be learned. Years ago, I did write a an article for um, documentary editing, the professional journal, and uh, it was called The Meaning of Misspelled Words. So maybe I need to go back and read that again and uh, see what I think you can learn from the handwritten material that you don't learn from what's already out there and released. And you did cover some of those things in your Visions and Revisions book. Sure. I've mm -hmm. appreciated. Thanks. Kevin, right. go ahead and Kevin, go ahead and raise. You know, how, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's I'm, unmuted. Go ahead, Kevin. Let him go. Yeah. I, I just uh, to, to clarify, I think what he's saying about the unpublished would include like diaries. They're not all transcribed. So what is available is everything that's been transcribed. That's that's the simple answer. Um, you know, there are some some manuscripts that haven't been transcribed that are that are still there. Um, but everything that's been transcribed is what's been released. So it's not like they're hiding something that's not been done, uh, not been completed. All right. Thanks for that clarification, Kevin. Um, I know you'd raised your hand earlier. I don't know if you had a, a comment or a question you wanted to, to raise at this time. Uh, well, I was I had an example that went along with something that he said, but I don't know if we'll come back around to that. I, I've done a lot of prodding about a couple of uh, accounts that that Jan Loughborough wrote about. And I mentioned the names of the people because she, Ellen White, um, for different reasons, and I've as I've looked at different ones, she hid the identity of individuals. And we're, we're very familiar in the testimonies where it says Brother S or Brother R or whatever, you know, and, and in some cases, it's the first letter of their name. In other cases, it isn't at all. Um, but there were different reasons why people would be uh, kept incognito. And in some cases, because it was embarrassing, and that's it had to do with the Z file. But in other cases, uh, it was because Ellen White was giving them a chance to deal with the situation in their life without everybody knowing their business. And I, I think she tried to do that to a large degree. But this the example that I thought that I thought of was a brother R, and that R was a designation given by Loughborough, not by Ellen White herself. But I was able to find the the couple, the Riggs, and it was significant because it was the first vision that he ever witnessed. And it had three parts to it. One was for a brother that nobody knew who she was talking about. Turns out it was Riggs, Christopher Riggs. And another part was for Sister R, which was Mrs. Riggs. And then a third part was for Loughborough himself. And in each of those cases, um, there were things that nobody would have told her. And in, in the case of the brother, at the very time that they were having the meeting and she 
told about it, he was out of town and having an affair. And, and uh, she presented him with his um, actions, and he repented right then and there. And there's some evidence that he was recovered to the cause because yeah, after the embarrassment, because he still made contributions to the uh, Review and Herald after that, I could trace his name uh, by you know knowing what his name was. For the sister, it was an odd story, but she but um, Loughborough wrote about it in 1866. The event took place in I guess it would have been 1852 because that's when he first heard her. And in that case, um, she was having um, experiences that, that we would call paranormal experiences because uh, Rochester was not only the center of Adventism because the, the whites had moved there, but it was also the center of spiritualism. And, um, and so she was, even though she was an Adventist, she was drawn to engage in spiritualistic events. So she was sucked into that. And she was having nightly uh, visits by an apparition that told her if she shared it with anybody, that she that she would be strangled. And uh, Loughborough tells the story. And, you know, some people may may question his his credibility, because, you know, sometimes he, he may mix up things a little bit. But as I've been able to unravel the story, it all does tend to line up with the, with this couple. He was having an affair. He did confess to it. And she was having the visitation by these spiritual apparitions. And when she claimed the name of Jesus during a prayer session with other believers there in Rochester, she was liberated from that, uh, that presence. The third part was a message to Loughborough that he was to leave his business selling locks, window locks, and put his efforts fully into supporting the Adventists who believed in the Sabbath, because that was a new thing for him. And he did that, and God did bless him. So those were, I, I would say those are some good examples of prescience, and that's that's what I had my hand up to share. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kevin, for, for sharing. Uh, Ed, I think you were next. You seem to have dropped off and come back. So please go ahead, join the conversation. Thank you, Rod, for uh, stimulating the presentation. Uh, perhaps the slide that you presented that captured my attention the most was the one where you said most of her writings could have been written from her reading, from her communications with others, from sermons, and from her own ideas, if I have those listed correctly. Uh, that really caught my attention. Uh, one reason it caught my attention is I'm doodling around with a written piece uh, trying to conceive of a, a new narrative about Ellen White that uh, might be valuable. Um, and my very first point in the new narrative is that she used many sources in her writing. Uh, and you can't usually tell from the writing itself which source may be in play. Uh, for example, now, I think Ron Numbers in his book, Prophetess of Health, convincingly argued that a lot of what Ellen White had to say about health came from what she learned by taking James to the water cure places of the day with their very uh, spare views of diet and life, um, which then showed up in her works. Uh, I guess I was convinced that some of what she got about health came from that source. We know that she looked at the growing numbers of uh, Italians and Irish coming into the country, uh, as the rest of the country did. Uh, and there was some hysteria about all these 
Catholic people coming in because basically the United States was a Protestant country to begin with. Um, and so then we got all excited about Catholics. Um, I think she was influenced in what she said by beliefs that the church adopted itself. And she being a good supporter of the church, a, a uh, very enthusiastic supporter of the, this new church, uh, would support the doctrines that the church held to be true. Uh, that may have occurred without any inspiration, so to speak, whatsoever. Uh, so I think there are many sources that Ellen White used, and in reading her work, it seems to me like we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, it makes it difficult uh, because you you may question her sources, uh, but it, that's a reality. So that particular slide, Ron, really caught my attention, and I'm wondering if there's anything you would like to do to expand on that. Uh, uh, if I can interrupt, you know, and I had I did raise my hand. Um, I I want to say uh, a word about um, uh, that topic. You know, as I said, I, I uh, Kevin Morgan and I work together, and I have the greatest respect for for Kevin and and his previous comments. He was he was citing some of the evidence he finds that Ellen White did in fact. Um, uh, experienced prescience, and she knew things about these people that only God could have revealed to her. Uh, Kevin is a is a more thorough and careful and diligent researcher in Ellen White studies than I am, and I especially value Kevin as a friend because he is what I call a congenial conservative. There are other conservatives like the Standish brothers who are just downright nasty when they talk about you. But Kevin, even if he disagrees with you, and he diligently works on all these different topics and so on and so forth. So before you go off on any tangent and so on, you ought to check what Kevin has written on the topic. Uh, and he publishes many of his papers on that uh, website, uh, academia.edu. And you can download them from there and study them uh, and so on but you know we shouldn't just because we fi we find that she quoted something almost word for word from a uh, a previous source we we shouldn't conclude that god had nothing to do with that and that has that it bears no inspiration you know uh um uh, I, I think God can can uh, guide our reading and God could guide her reading and God could she might read something and then be impressed in a vision that that was something true and valid that she ought to ought to include. So there is uh, in the Bible we have uh, Bible writers using, Using previous uh, previously written things, so we need to keep uh, we need to keep uh, a um, a flexible view of inspiration, and we need to keep conversing with um, people who differ with us. Uh, Kevin and I differ on uh, on uh, the reliability of uh, of Jay and Loughborough. Uh, now, on the other side of the spectrum, there is a fellow I won't mention his name. But he grew up a very uh, a diligent student of Ellen White. And then when he found out that she had borrowed from others, he was totally annoyed. And he continues to study diligently and to try to prove that she is a, a, a fraud and so on and so forth. So I even consult him sometimes when I, when I want to. I, I might be reading something in Ellen White and I, say, I might say to myself, you know that sounds like she might have borrowed it from there, as some for some place, but I think I can't find it. Let me write to this guy. He may he may, he may be able to find it. And of course, now with art, artificial intelligence, some people are even trying to employ that to find out. But even if you find out that she borrowed some words from some other place, that doesn't mean it doesn't have it. The uh, it doesn't bear the imprints of inspiration, and it doesn't mean that it can't edify and inspire us. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ron, and thanks, Ed, for that question. Um, and you've actually brought me back to, you know, what I wanted to ask after Bjorn had had spoken 
Um, I really just wanted to get my thoughts together because I am by no means a scholar on Ellen White and her work. I've read quite a lot of it uh, growing up in the church um, and even as an adult, just trying to kind of understand why Adventists believe what we believe. Um, the challenge that I have isn't with regards to being flexible with my understanding of inspiration. The challenge that I have is the unwillingness on her part in her time and thereafter of the church to acknowledge how her inspiration um, would have been expressed. Uh, meaning I can read something and be inspired by it. And when I'm, cause even when I'm writing for Adventists today, I will pull in quotes from other things that I've read over the years to help to put together, to make the point that I'm making on a particular issue. Um, and plagiarism standards aside, um, that doesn't mean that pulling all of these thoughts together mean that I wasn't inspired to put this piece together. Uh, however, I am not suggesting that these words came directly from God. Um, and I think that is where I have a challenge, um, particularly with the leadership of the church today. Um, there are different levels and different types of inspiration. And I'm not sure that while we are asked to be flexible about our understanding of inspiration, that the leadership of the church is flexible. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's a challenge to inerrancy that um, makes it difficult um, for that to be acknowledged. Um, I'm not sure, but maybe you could share, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that kind of, kind of inspiration um, and the fact that, or the, the hesitance to acknowledge uh, just how much of what she would have written would have come from other inspired writers and some not inspired because uh, some of them having been proven after the fact um, to not actually have been as she would have expressed them. Uh, so I want your thoughts on, on that hesitance that we have um, today. I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I know that we have a very different, uh, a, a very wide uh, spectrum of uh, beliefs and interpretations, and we just need to, uh, uh, to, uh, to try to be tolerant and patient with each other. In fact, when I quoted that um, statement that uh, Ted Wilson made in uh, 2015 about uh, her being a inspire, you know, an authoritative commentary on scripture. I really did something there that I probably should be feel guilty about, because I displayed next to his quote all the angry and unpleasant expressions that I have, that I have seen uh, him display. It made me think of uh, uh, what's going on in politics today. You know, you, you, you have to wonder if some of the appeal of uh, um, Kamala Harris, as opposed to Donald Trump, is because whenever you see a picture of Kamala Harris, it's, she, she's smiling and laughing and having a good time on Often when you see a paper with Donald Trump, he's angry and and uh, uh, troubled, or and and, and and of course the media is choosing these things and and projecting these these visual images. So if I ever present this again, I'll try to find some more flattering pictures of Ted, uh, of Ted Wilson to show. But um, I, I just don't know exactly yet how to to answer your question. So I have to wait till I finish my Oxford book and then see what see what I can do then. All right, uh, no problem. I see Dr. Hemmings wants to join the conversation. Please go ahead. Um, you're not yet unmuted, Olive. Yes. Okay, go ahead now. So, Sharon, I was going to begin with something that addresses your question because Ellen White herself said in selected messages, I think that that's, that's a quotation in my day every... Um, Adventist college student had to learn. Selected messages, book one, page 
uh, 21, paragraph 2. It's not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the people, well, I don't like to say men, the people that are inspired, that the inspiration doesn't act on the person's words, but on the person's expression. And then she says, the person receives the impress of, you know, the words, they pre receive the impress of the individual mind and so on and so forth. And then she says, so eventually the utterances of the human person becomes the word of God. So to me, Ellen White is aware that there's not this black and white, these words came exactly from God, you know, but, um, and uh, Dr. Graybill can respond to that. But I want to say this, though, as far as Ellen White. Uh, when I was a, a professor at the Adventist University in Jamaica, there was a day when the university president called me in to speak with me. Um, and he said, he said he, it's an open secret on campus and at the union that I don't believe in Ellen White. And when he said that, I don't believe in Ellen White, I there's just this anger that bubbled up in me. I'm thinking, I don't believe in any human being. <laughs> and so I was very calm. I said to him, they're right. I don't believe in Ellen White. And I let him stew in that for a little bit. <laughs> I said, but I believe in the God who used Ellen White. We use Ellen White to nurture this church. And I believe that without Ellen White, perhaps this church would not be the historical force that it is today. <laughs> All right. And I told him why students were sending it around campus that I didn't believe in Ellen White. Because I'd give students an ex exegetical paper and they'll come to me with quotes all over from Ellen White. I said, this is an exegetical paper. Ellen White is not a theologian. She was never a theologian. She was a prophet. You cannot use Ellen White's writing to give me a theological exegetical paper. So I returned all those papers. I would say to my students, they would come to me and say, oh, Ellen White says so and so. I said, I don't agree with that. And they would say, how dare you disagree with Ellen White? I let them know that Ellen White, how much I respect her. But I let them know Ellen White was a prophet. She was not a theologian. I'm a theologian. And I was very unapologetic in making it clear to my students that I do not use Ellen White for theological, biblical, exegetical references. All right? Now I say to my students, you may use Ellen White if at some point, having done the good work of exegesis, that her writing or her idea becomes relevant. All right? And so... I'm just saying it out loud. I, I, I know that Revelation 19.10 is not referring to Ellen White or the writings of Ellen White. I know that because I'm a biblical theologian. All right? And, and so, but I want people to know that Ellen White, I don't believe in heroes or sheroes, if you want to call it. But if I have any such thing in my consciousness, it is Ellen White. And how did that happen? I wrote a book, Life Sketches. And I could not put that book down. And I was so impressed with this woman who from a teenager dedicated her entire life to a purpose that she believed was infinitely beyond her and beyond her personal interest. And so for me, and of course I did a lot of research in Ellen White, I saw Ellen White as a conscience in a denomination that could have descended into blatant racism, sexism, all those things. I saw her as a conscience there. So for me, if I have one hero in the world, as I say, I don't believe in heroes and sheroes, it is Ellen White. And I, if I could just hold up my computer here, you know, this is, this is a picture above my desk at the university that I teach. Picture of Ellen White. My daughter comes in the office and she cringes. I said, why? She said, it, she said it invokes King John, King John whom? <laughs> but I had to explain to her why to me Ellen White is important in my own ministry as a theology professor, and not because I have any cultish idea of Ellen White, but because she is to me an example 
of how one person can dedicate themselves to herself to a cause that is infinitely beyond her. I do not have black and white approaches to life. The fact that she used other sources does not in any way to me um, diminish her importance and the way God used her for an, in an institution that has a worldwide grasp that whose health system and education system is second only to the Roman Catholic Church. And to me, Ellen White is foundational in all of that. So that is why she's my hero, even though I disagree <laughs> with a lot of her theology. <laughs> but I, that's all I had to say. But um, Dr. Graybill, um, I don't know if the Selected Messages Book 121 explains some of Sherry Ann's um, concern. Hopefully it does. That's good. Thanks. Thank you so much, Olive. Really appreciate that useful distinction um, that you've highlighted. Uh, Dr. Thompson, please go ahead and join the conversation. Yeah, I'm not doctor, I'm engineer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pastor Grayville, thank you for your mm -hmm. presentation. Too a little louder, a little louder. All right, can you hear me now? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Why can't I turn it up? All right, uh, thank you for your presentation, Ron. Two questions. Number one, the evolution you've described about the church's view of Ellen White. I see a lot of parallels with what other churches and what corporations do. They spend a lot of time creating a mythology regarding the church, regarding their teachings. Apple Computer, for example, has a huge mythology related to the role of Steve Jobs. They have a Steve Jobs University internal in the company. So isn't that just something that is quite normal? And then question number two, the role of uh, the administrators of the Ellen G. White estate being her children and grandchildren and so on that would probably be considered uh, very inappropriate today. How do you think that has influenced the administration of her writings? Well, uh, as you know, Gil Valentine has uh, uh, written that, that book about the prophet and the presidents, about the, uh, the fate of the uh, Ellen White estate in relation to the church um, after her death, and that's that, 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 that's very uh, uh, helpful. Um, I, I think uh, I, I don't know that it it could have happened any other way. You know, uh, Willie White, Ellen White had two sons, and Edson uh, was the problem child. Uh, and he helped in some ways later on, but Willie was the one who stayed with her. And Willie, Willie has given us a lot of explanations and a lot of uh, insight into her work and her writings. And uh, uh, and so um, I would uh, I, I do value his his contribution, and Arthur White too. But you know we all have to uh, we all have to learn, and we all have to profit from what they did. And uh, as time goes on, uh, the the White State brings in more and more different kinds of people. And now we have these research centers all around the world, and they have different uh, uh, people involved there as well. So uh, I think we're doing the best we can right now. And uh, I don't see uh, uh, a lot changing too quickly, but uh, we have... I think uh, pretty much all the resources we need to make intelligent decisions about uh, her writings and uh, her role in the church. All right, thank you so much, uh, Carson, and thanks for that response, uh, Ron. Emmanuel, please go ahead and join the conversation. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I enjoy the presentation. And I would like to start with a story. I met a man a couple of years ago. He used to be at the North American Division Department of Education. 
And because of this function, meeting with other people doing the same thing in other denominations, he came to the conclusion that he need advanced degree. He went to the University of Maryland and he did a PhD in American religious history. And he did his PhD on Ellen White. This man is Dr. Osborne. He say he almost lost his faith. He say he learned stuff outside the church that his church was supposed to teach him. He say he felt betrayed by his church. It's true, it's not true. He says that in the public forum, I'm just repeating what he said. Number two, the problem we have with Ellen White is not she borrow or she did not borrow. The problem is the way the church introduced her to us. And she is not really who they introduced us. Let me give you an example. Dr. Aiming talked about exegesis a few minutes ago. What do you want me to believe? She described Jesus with a bell and pomegranate on his dress. This is a Levitical priest. This is not a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is true or this is not true. Beyond the point, I have some question. And I would like my question to be answered. Last but not least, what is the place of Ellen White in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Why we have to make a faith we believe in her if we want to be baptized, if we want to be part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, if I don't believe in her and her prophetic gift, I cannot be baptized in the Adventist Church. What is the problem? Um, I do not know how to answer these concerns. All right. Uh, Emmanuel, you wanted to say something else? Um, as long as the problem will not be solved, we will be one million years from today talking about the same thing. But I accept your answer. Thank All you. Right. Thank, thanks, thanks, Emmanuel. Um, Bill, uh, you have your hand up. Please go ahead and join the conversation. Thank you. Um, we keep looking at the prophet to try to understand uh, whether um uh there is inherent right to be if you will a prophet um the maybe looking at the role of a prophet uh seems it seems helpful to me prophets in the old testament show up not to get people in a state that god can feel free to engage with them, but rather to counter any doubts that people have, considering the plight they find themselves in when it seems God is a long ways away and looking the other direction. And, and so people need, if you will, a prophet at that moment. And um, they reach out naturally. If the people didn't accept the prophet, the prophet has no authority. And if and if we picture what was happening um, at uh, following the the um, is the the utter failure of Millerism. I mean, Ellen White seems to be prophetic, like God is present 
in her and therefore with them. Um, so, so it almost doesn't matter what she is trying to teach if indeed she is successful in reminding us that uh, God's presence supersedes our theological failures, our confusions, our inability to understand. And uh, I wonder if, um, if that isn't the message, if you will, of the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14, when, um, when the announcement is, uh, you are left to the, to the experience of your limbic system and not your cortex when it comes to dealing with God. You are fearful. You are given to glorification. You are given to worship. This is not rational behavior. And it's almost as though that's the only way you can never be wrong. And maybe there was an attraction uh, from the perspective of the role of the prophet, not necessarily the technical details uh, of, um, of the person of Ellen White in that role. Is, is, is that in any way a, a useful uh, possibility of looking at Ellen White that uh, gets, us, uh, gets us into maybe a, um, an experiential sense as opposed to a technical sense, Ron? I, I uh, appreciate your comments, and I think it's a question that we can all reflect on, and I don't think I have a, 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 a profound a, a answer to it. I, I was fascinated that you started out by mentioning the, the silence of God in some of our, our situations. I recently, uh, uh, after this Pathfinder Campery, uh, when they had such a terrible storm, and everything. I was curious as to whether some of the uh, the young pathfinders, who may not be as theologically uh, sophisticated as uh, some of us who are older, uh, how they could say, did any of them say, how in the world could God allow such a storm to uh, disrupt our wonderful camporee that our, our uh, uh, remnant church has planned, and so on and so forth? And uh, so I asked this question innocently enough, and uh, somebody responded to me and said, oh, are you a Calvinist? Do you believe in God? And I said, my word, I believe in God. It's, it's just that, that I wondered if these young people were able to cope with it the way the rest of us are. So anyway, we'll just have to continue to think about these things. And thank you for your comments. All right. Thanks, Bill, um, for that. Uh, Dr. Johnson, please go ahead and join the conversation. Uh, you're not yet unmuted. Could you unmute? Yeah. Okay. okay go ahead. Here we go. Okay. You had me unmuted, and I unmuted myself. Uh, a very helpful presentation, Ron, and uh, you have a lot to uh, to offer us. Here's my question: <clears throat> Do many of our problems with Ellen White arise from her singularity? If uh, if the uh, gift of prophecy had been more widely diffused <clears throat> in the early church. Uh, I think that our definition of the prophetic gift and of inspiration would have been different. And also, uh, 109 years have passed since Ellen White died, and I think uh, as time uh, goes on without any replacement or any further manifestation of the gift of prophecy, her writings uh, take on uh, more of the flavor of uh, a canon. So I, my question, I guess, is what is the effect of Ellen White's singularity and is our concept of uh, the gift of prophecy adversely affected by it? You know, this is an interesting question because, you know, early Adventists argued 
about the perpetuity of spiritual gifts, that they didn't end in the days of the apostles, that they were still absent. And that was, so it was justified to claim that, that Ellen White was a, was a prophet in, uh, in their day. But as you say, she's been dead a long time. And by the way, the spirit of prophecy is not Ellen White. It's not her writing. The spirit of prophecy is this Holy Spirit that inspired the prophets, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that the Holy Spirit is still active in the church and in our lives and so on. Maybe not in the same way and in the same level, but I think we we can look at some prophetic voices in our own time without uh, necessarily attributing to them the same kind of level of authority that uh, uh, over time has been attributed uh, to Ellen White. But yes, we should we should seek the Holy Spirit in our own lives, and we should seek messages from God in every way that we can. I go into some of these huge natural history museums in Denmark or here in, in the United States, and I look at all of this, all of this beautiful uh, and varied uh, uh, natural things, and I say to myself. I don't know if God created it in six literal days. I don't know if he created it in uh, 10,000 years ago. Uh, but uh, it looks to me like uh, life is still being created uh, as time goes on. So let's let's learn all we can from the Holy Spirit, from the gifts of rationality that God gave us, and from our fellowship with one another. Thank you. If uh, there had been a multiplicity of prophets in the uh, Adventist movement in the early years, would that have been uh, better or worse? Well, there, in fact, in a sense, there was a multiplicity of prophets, but the other ones were uh, illegitimate or illegitimated, you know, or didn't follow through. And so on. So uh, that's an uh, it, it's it's an imponderable question. It didn't happen that way, so we're not sure what 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 would have happened. And uh, I doubt very much that any Adventist or anyone else in the world would be able to uh, claim now that they have suddenly been gifted with the with the gift of prophecy. In a sense, the Mormons have a have a built in. Uh, way of perpetuating the spiritual gift, uh, spirit, the gift of prophecy, because they they claim that each one of their presidents is, 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 is continuing with that. So they have a way of believing in the perpetuity of spiritual gifts that goes beyond what we do. But um, no, we, we, need to, uh, we need to learn in every way we can from each other and from our prayers and from our study of scripture, from our study of science, history, and biblical exegesis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob, for that question. Uh, Lauren, I believe you have a question for Kevin. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I don't hope you don't mind. And Ron, I hope you don't mind me turning to Kevin for this one. But I, don't, I, I also want you to think about this and maybe talk about it a little bit after I ask Kevin. Um, Kevin, for someone like me, and by the way, those of you who don't know Kevin, he's a he's a pastor and a very thorough uh, Ellen White scholar. Uh, I'm not sure where you are, Kevin, I, but I know it's somewhere out out North in North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay, I knew it was somewhere out east here where I am in in, in my time zone. Uh, I have to say that I fall somewhere. I was deeply appreciative of Olive's. Uh, discussion. I, I, I think, yes, Ellen White was a great feminist. I see her as essential to the founding of my church. Some of the great things that she said survived. But Kevin, I have to say, I'm still deeply troubled by the fact that she copied things and didn't say where she copied them from. I, I can't, that that prevents me, uh, unlike my friend Bjorn, who who saw it differently, and Bjorn is one of my better best friends. It it interferes with my ability to understand her as quote inspired. 
Not, not, not that it interferes with my ability to get some good out of what she wrote, but people took that label inspired and made it so that they could do kind of verbal inspiration and throw it, pummel people with, with the things that she said. And that that bothers me. Kevin, you are somebody who takes on white very seriously. I know that. Can you give a a hermeneutic for people like me who struggle with the copying, who who feel like she wasn't quite honest? Uh, am I left with nothing but history? She was part of our history. And yet I don't want to leave it at that either. Uh, help me to see how you see it. Okay, uh, great question. And I would I would say, <clears throat> for me, um, the key is communication. How do you best communicate concepts that that um, a person would receive from God in her okay. case? How do what what makes her communication effective? And um, and so. You know, you 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 may be familiar with the fact that I worked with Fred Veltman's assistant in writing her first mm -hmm. her first book, which was my first book on the on her use of other uh, authors, and and it was a kind of a crisis of faith to me too at that time. Oh, interesting. Um, to say, wow, what what is she doing here? And until I could understand what she was doing, and. Uh, and and I dug much deeper than what her original manuscript provided. All she was showing me was similarities. And if you amass similarities without doing the extra step of saying, okay, how is she incorporating this? Are these concepts she has expressed previously? Are these things that she that we have objective evidence that she understood before she incorporated other people's wording? Um, it falls short. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron mentioned uh, a, a fellow that we both know who has done extensive work of gathering similar material, similar material. Right. And, um, and if you only judge it by similarity, you miss the nuance of what she's doing. All right. So communication requires putting things in, in the best words possible. Preachers are known for being borrowers sure. because they hear an expression and they say, that's a great expression. I'm going to use it. The next time I talk about that subject, I'm going to borrow the way they said that. We right. would not fault or, or, them. Or even, even take a Bible story, Kevin, and, and uh, embroider it and, and say, what could be happening here? The difference is I don't say, God has shown this to me. Right. Okay. Well, so then, then we have to look at the complexity of what she did. And I'm, I wrote in the comments this thought that occurred to me because that same individual judges her as if she has any other sources for expression or for even ideas, then, well, then she can't be inspired. And, and, I, and I thought to myself... So you mean when a person signs up to be a, a prophet, they are not allowed to read other people's stuff. They're not allowed to talk to other people and, and, and gain information from other people. They're not able to use history. They are restricted only to reproduce what they have seen in vision. Is that correct? Does that seem fair? It, I, I don't restrict her to only say what she what an angel told her or that sort of thing. I do fault her though, Kevin, when she says an angel showed me and then the words that follow are exactly what some other author wrote or were worded in that way by one of her secretaries like uh, Bolton or uh, the other lady. That, that, that troubles me, Kevin. Okay, well, let's take that particular example. Uh, and it is one example. And Ron included it in a paper, early paper that I read of his. And when he did write about it, he provided the, the answer. And that was on other occasions when she was trying to report what an angel said, 
she didn't remember the explicit words that they said. And so she would say, let me reconstruct it for you or put it in, in words. So the, the idea that she expressed on that occasion, which she said the angel had told her, was an idea that she had expressed earlier and used that particular wording when she was delivering it before. She found it a convenient way to speak something. So she's reconstructing the point made by the angel. And in that particular case, it was that a lot of times in our lives, and this is the the specifics of that that quotation, that the angel was telling her that a lot of times we don't understand the circumstances of our lives, but that God is is using those experiences for us. Now, that's a profound thought. She used somebody else to express that thought, but it's a very simple thought. And it's one that that she had expressed on other occasions, not using those words. So I don't begrudge her to be able to to try to reconstruct using better words. My understanding of her as a person is that at one point in her life, and I think Ron would corroborate this, at one point in her life, she had intended to become a scholar, to, to be good with words and study, and, and that, that opportunity fell, fell apart early in her life. And so she was always playing catch up in the way that she was able to um, compensate for her lack of, of being able to apply herself as a scholar, as a young person. And once you miss that, you can't really replace it. Right. You know? It's like yeah, she, I, she spoke about wanting to to be a, be, a better scholar than she was. And she tried she tried to do that at one point, but it's just it just doesn't happen. You know, yeah. I, I wished at one time that I could speak Spanish like a native speaker. Mm-hmm. But that that window broke. Now, I can speak Spanish and and I, I can preach in Spanish and pray in Spanish, but there's still always going to be a limit. And if I if I could go back and do it as a child. I, you know, I would have a greater mastery. She couldn't do that. So, so I would say that for her in her position, having missed some of that, part of her compensation was to borrow phrasing from others. Now, borrowing phrasing does not mean that she stole what they said and took it as her own. Because when she incorporates it, there are a number of things that she does to the quotations. One of the key quotations uh, that people use about her is her description of, of inspiration, which she borrows from another author. And, so, and somebody say, aha, see, similar with similar, she stole that idea. But if you can't compare the two ideas, even though she jots this down in her diary, and it isn't published for the first time until the, 18, the 1940s, and then it's picked up by Nicole or somebody else later, she is grappling with, how do I describe my concept of inspiration? So she takes a known platform of somebody who's describing it, but she disagrees with him on on some very fundamental levels. Mm -hmm. And she takes that expression, and then she transforms it into a different concept, though using many of the same words. And I think that that's... That's maybe it's a shortcut, but yeah. it wasn't his idea. His idea was different. Her concept is is unique. Yeah, Kevin, I I want to I want to let Ron weigh in on this, but um, yeah, I, I, you're you're walking a very nuanced line here, and and I think you realize that it, it's a very difficult line to. It, it's it's like walking a bit of a tightrope to to stay on there, but Ron, you you know. Me and people like me, we have a lot of friends in common out in Southern California who have the same concerns that I have. How do you explain to them what Ellen White should be? And and again, I'm very appreciative of people like Kevin. I'm appreciative of what Olive did. I never put down people who say Ellen White has meant a lot to me. But at the same time, I struggle with it. And, And Ron, do you have any insight I'd like to hear it from maybe something that you would have to say about this. I don't have anything to add at this moment. As some of you know, there's a whole group of us 
are working on a book, uh, with different chapters of a book, which in fact uh, tries to answer this question and tries to say, if we accept, at least to some degree, all the scholarship that's gone on in the last 50 years, if we accept it, and so on, what is the value and relevance and usefulness of Ellen White going forward? So I want to just uh, wait for that book to come out. I don't have anything special to add to what uh, Kevin has said at this at, at this moment. Thank you right. very much. That's precisely what I, what I think a lot of us are sitting here waiting for is what is the usefulness of Ellen White at this point? We know historically where she stands, uh, but we're not quite sure whether beyond what has been sort of absorbed into the church so that I'm grateful for, such as the emphasis on education, the emphasis on health. I was very much benefited by those things. But what do I do with Ellen White now with the deep concerns that I have a, a, about her credibility? And it seems like you're not quite ready to to address that. That's right. That's right. Let's go on to some other questioners. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to have to leave, folks, but God bless you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and thanks, Lauren, for that question. And I guess we will all wait uh, to be able to get a, a more complete response on that. Um, Art, please go ahead and join the conversation. Thank you. I'm sorry, Kevin just left, but if, if Kevin's a very skilled uh, apologist for Ellen White. If you want to see any of his material, he's got a YouTube channel, Ellen White Reconsidered. I've watched some of them. He's very, very good at it. I don't agree with him, but that uh, you, you can be good and not agree with me. That's not a problem. Uh, I hesitated to until Lauren started asking more people to raise their hands to to raise my hand and say anything because. I'm not even a, a believer, uh, but my background is in the Adventist Church, and and it is the church of my youth. And I think it's worth, I, I may be able to say a couple things that could be a little bit helpful. Um, I don't know why the church finds it so necessary to defend the sainthood of Ellen White, because that seems to be what's always being done. There are leaders of the church that were indispensable, who had plenty of flaws. And I think of one right off the top that was very closely related to Ellen White. There has been a lot of biographies written of various pioneers recently. And James White doesn't fare real well uh, in terms of, you know, the kind of guy you'd like to sit down and have a beer. I'm sorry, a soy milk with. He's not, he is not a fun person. And he had a lot of flaws, but he was indispensable to the uh, foundation of the Adventist church. Without him, frankly, Ellen probably wouldn't have been successful. He was, he had a good business sense. He was, he was driven and he did, he did a lot of good things, but that man had flaws coming out his ears. Uh, <clears throat> the apostle Paul is probably the foremost, uh, well, is the foremost and greatest writer of the, uh, of the early church. I don't think anybody here, well, I guess he's called St. Paul, isn't he? But he had lots of flaws, and I find lots of flaws when I read his materials. Um, I, I think that what we really, what the church really needs to do is develop, de develop a way of looking at Ellen White as a historical figure, as an indispensable person to the founding of the Adventist church, and leave it there. She is not the end-all and be-all of spiritual thought. She may have played a very significant role, and she did play a very significant role in the founder of the church, but why can't she just be a beloved founder? Why must she be St. Ellen? Why must she be perfect? Uh, it, there's no end of the apologetics can be done trying to defend her and make everything she did the best and the most righteous. Um you folks remember you that are that are uh, and that's most of you were raised in in North America or studied any or knew any American history uh, have seen people who were indispensable to the founding of the United States who stories of their sainthood grew up among among us 
remember, George Washington couldn't tell a lie. And remember that when his father confronted him over a cherry tree that had been chopped down, George Washington, unlike most kids and unlike what I did when I was a child and automatically told a lie, said, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. Well, you know, that's not good history. It's not true. It was a myth that grew up. But George Washington didn't have to be perfect in order to be an indispensable man, in order to be an indispensable founding of this country, founder of this country. Let's grow up in our history. Let's grow up in the way we view founders. And let's not make them be perfect. I, I was very disillusioned, and it had a lot to do with my departing the Adventist church and eventually departing Christianity when I realized how the church had lied to me for so many years. Stop the lying. Make her into the indispensable founder. And that's plenty good. Thanks. Thanks so much, Art, uh, for your for your comments. Uh, Ron, did you want to respond to that, or should we go? No, to that's that's first? enough. Go on to the next. All right, <laughs> All right Rebecca, Terry, you Terry, are I'm, next. Before, before you do, Rebecca, okay. at three thirty, I generally come on and tell you what's coming up next week, and in other weeks, and uh, we've got some great people on the calendar next week. Writer Brinsma is returning, and. Uh, you know, I've told you before, I, I try to have a mix of topics. And so uh, some of the topics are theological, some of them are historical, some of them are pastoral. Uh, this one probably is more in the pastoral side, but it also reaches into who we are as Adventists, because that's something we at Adventists today like, really like to, to explore. And in this case, uh, what I'm talking, what Reinder is going to talk about is our reputation. They talk about personal reputation, of course, and how we preserve it, but also the reputation of the church. How are we seen outside? And that, that's a big concern of mine. It's something I write about often. What do people think when we hand out the great controversy, for example, which to me is essentially a, a hateful diatribe against Roman Catholics? I don't like it at all. And uh, so Reinder is going to dig into that. Uh, after that, we have uh, in, in September, we have uh, coming, um, let me see, let me get my calendar here. I think I remember everybody, but I want to be sure. Um, we have uh, Sigve Tonstead coming in September. Uh, we have uh, Brian Ness, who is going to do something about uh, spirituality and to what extent do does genetics govern spirituality uh we have uh Sigve Tonstead by the way hasn't given me a topic yet you have Courtney Ray uh she is a young African American um uh, pastor who is working in mental health at this point and she's going to be addressing us in September and uh, so we have some really great people coming up. I'm still looking for a teacher for August 21. That's the only one I have empty right now. Uh, so very much looking forward to the people who are coming. And uh, please, by the way, share Abbas today with a few friends. I think that might help. Uh, we want to keep our, I think we're the, the largest uh, online Abbotus class at this point. And that's thanks to you guys who really have appreciated the people we've we've uh, invited, uh, like Ron Graybill. And thank you very much, Ron, for being here. Uh, okay, that's all I have to say. And uh, Cherry Ann, go ahead and uh, take the next hands. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Um, and I think Ron just dropped off. He did put a message uh, in the chat that he has to go. Uh, I am not seeing him online, so I guess uh, he's, he's he's dropped off. But I guess we can share comments. Uh, oh, and we'll keep talking, if, sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, Jerry has not yet spoken. Um, so I'm going to go to to Jerry and then come back to to Bill and Olive. Uh, Jerry. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's there there he is. Jerry, yeah, no, you just, didn't get on earlier. You had quite a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, people did. We missed most of it, but we'll go back and listen to it. 
and I've uh, read quite a bit of Ron's material over the years. Um, you know, I, my wife and I are on this, you know, Sabbath afternoon seminar because we enjoy it and we enjoy the stimulation and the intellectual bantering and uh, the various ideas. Um, but as a retired pastor, um, if if I were even when I before I retired nine years ago, if I were to take even the information I know now, having spent the last nine years reading a lot about Alan White, trying to get to the bottom of some things, uh, I would probably get fired. Uh, you know, I would. The average person in the pew couldn't accept it. And they would phone the conference president, and I would get called in on the carpet, which in 35 years of ministry never happened. But uh, that that would probably what be what happened. And and there's any number of either former pastors, uh, you know, maybe some retired pastors who retired early because of that kind of scenario. I know of some. Um, but I just think that it's unfortunate that those kinds of things should happen within the denomination. You know, should we just say, well, that's part of the evolution of a religious organization. There's a certain amount of fallout. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's it. Um, you know, if the seminary were to teach, and I really enjoyed my years in the seminary in 83 to 85, uh, they couldn't have taught this stuff back then. Uh, they would have been fired. Um, Roger Kuhn certainly didn't teach it in my class on Ellen White, uh, as much as I appreciated Roger. So, yeah, I'm just just sort of just saying it, it's unfortunate that this kind of issue even is an issue within the denomination uh, and that the fallout of disagreeing or learning reality and speaking the now present knowledge or reality uh, becomes such a problem within the system. That's, that's it. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for that, Jerry. Uh, Bill? Uh, thanks again. Um, in responding to um, Lauren and uh, Kevin's um, discussion of um, what seems fraudulent behavior. Um, I think the, the point may be not that God communicates directly with a person, but that somehow we sense God communicates with us somehow through that person. And, and that sense is not necessarily language dependent. It's inspirational. Uh, it can be inspirational. And the problem comes when we, at least it may come, when we feel that we have to know something special and practice in some special way in order for God to be free to um, embrace us eternally, if you will. If, if we can get past that, uh, it seems we can feel much more comfortable acknowledging Ellen White as a prophet, uh, even to the extent that uh, the people surrounding her were tightly legalistic, and she seemed to support that. Uh, it seems also that the denomination inherently benefits uh, from not um, uh, addressing that that matter and um if if we can if we can somehow let the usefulness of ellen white continue independent of the technical parts that we are in discussion over um maybe there's some benefit to that i i, I remember that ag daniels in the 1919 bible conference said you know we can't have we 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 cannot make ellen white's reality dependent on did she really hold up that Bible with one hand? <laughs> we we, we got to get beyond that, that type of analysis. So the question is, how can we and should we, uh, if you will, um, allow Ellen White to be useful or embrace Ellen White as useful and meaningful 
um, to us, indeed to me, especially if there is no special knowledge or practice required uh, for uh, our salvation. And I'm, I'm not asking Ron that, but I am asking, is there another way of looking at Ellen White that gets us past all of these arguments over the details? And is that a valid possibility? All right, thanks for that, Bill. Um, and I think Dr. Hemming, who is up next, may help to sh <laughs> shed yeah. some light on what we can yeah, do with indeed. that. Yeah, uh, indeed. Before I make my point, I I would suggest, Bill, that we 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 really go back to look at who a prophet really is. We we define our understanding of Ellen White as a prophet with the true understanding of who a prophet is. You know. Who is a prophet? A prophet is not a person who comes and tells you things just as they drop from the heavens. A prophet is someone who speaks for God, a someone who speaks truth to power, a one who nurtures a community, one who leads and guides a community. Um, so I think we need to perhaps, you know, return to the biblical concept of what a prophet is. And the prophet is not a perfect being. The prophet is a human being. All right. And we must allow Ellen White to be human, allow Ellen White to be a person of our time, allow Ellen White as a 19th century white woman to have expressed some kind of racism at some point. <laughs> allow <laughs> Ellen White to be who Ellen White is it does not mean that she mm. is not a prophet. Look at the work mm. she has done in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That, to me, identifies her fully as a prophet, not whether she plagiarized or she did not plagiarize. You know, that, that is how I look at it. It's a wholesome concept of what prophet is. You can look at the biblical prophets. They weren't perfect either. But I don't, I don't remember who said it, but um, somebody raised the objection of Ellen White being held up as a saint. The problem I have with Ellen White being held up as a saint is because she's held up as a saint simply as a tool of control by the church. She's being used as a tool of control, mind control. That is what is problematic to me about Ellen White being held up as a saint. Look at a church whose major authority outside of scriptures is a woman called Ellen White, and yet, you despise the idea of women being recognized for their work as ministers of the gospel. It's not just, <laughs> you're not rejecting them as ministers of the gospel. You are refusing to bestow upon them the same status <laughs> as you bestow upon males. So to me, that is my bone of contention with our church. We need to stop using Ellen White as a tool of mind control. It's an ungodly way of being. And I think Ellen White, if there's such a thing, rolls over in her grave every day. She has no rest day and night because of the way we are using her writings, using it, abusing it. That's, that's my, you know, <laughs> my take on the sainthood of Ellen White. Thank you so much uh, for your contributions, Dr. Hemmings. Uh, Ed, uh, you may go ahead and rejoin the conversation. I just want to reflect for a moment on the dynamics of our conversations today. Um, it seems to me that for most people, there is a line of some kind. And that for a number of years, we've been skating toward that line. And in our skating, we're asking a lot of questions about Ellen White. We're expressing a lot of skepticism about Ellen White. We're pointing out her foibles and the true dynamics of how she worked and produced books and and all these things create negativity in our mind. But I've noticed that for most people, there is a line of some kind that they're a little bit fearful to cross. Um, and that line 
it would be at different places for different people. But I've noticed it today that people will point out her foibles and all the challenges about how to relate to her and her writings. But when they get to that line, they back off. It's almost like there's a fear factor of crossing that line because surely there's an abyss on the other side and all is lost if you go over there. Um, and I don't know where that line rightfully should be drawn. It goes back to, I think, um, Allah's question about how do we redefine her? Um, and there's all kinds of definitions in our mind that run from infallible saint or near pope like figure in our church, uh, all the way to she was a phony. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could come up with a standard definition uh, that made sense and that uh, would ease some of our questions and discomforts about her and her work? Um, but I don't know where your line is. I'm still searching for the place. Um, and it keeps moving on me. I suspect that might be true for many of us. But anyway, it's been just as interesting behind the words that have been spoken today, the dynamics of how we relate to this subject. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, and that yeah, definitely a useful observation. I've, I've seen that too. Uh, Emmanuel? Please go ahead and rejoin the conversation. Yes, um, we have a problem from a theological point of view when Ellen White's statement contradicts scripture. What we do is that. Let me give you an example. When uh, Mary came, as Jesus said, No, don't touch me. I didn't ascend it to my father. A few verses later, Thomas, Jesus say, see, touch me. Ellen White say, Jesus went to heaven to make sure that the father accepted his sacrifice and the father gave him power to give to the disciple and the same day he came back on planet earth. Beautiful. Where we found this story in scripture. Second thing, Ellen White there is a little book called The Retirement Year, page 161, page 162, page 163, give a strange story. Ellen White is communicating with a dead husband. So when I see this, I have to say to myself, wait a minute. If she's a prophet, what kind of prophet is that? When the children of Israel say, listen, it is one of the abomination that necessitate you to destroy the people that you are going to meet in the land. Contact with the dead. At the very least, there is something missing in my understanding. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emmanuel, for, for sharing that. That's a, a let me let me join in here and say, Emmanuel. I think a lot of people have questioned some of these things. And again, I, I've been appreciating those who joined in, like Olive, who said, come on, let's give her a break. Let's uh, regard her as a, a deeply godly person who, who was doing her best and contributed a lot for us. I still struggle, and, I, and I, I'm still a little disappointed that, that Ron didn't ask, answer my question. I appreciate that Kevin did. And that is, uh, help me, give me a hermeneutic for those of us who who are appreciative doubters. And, and I still haven't quite heard that, Emmanuel, and that, that concerns me. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the folks here. And, and when we finish up, Jerry Ann, uh, with the folks who have their hands raised, we'll just uh, bring it to an end. All right. Uh, yeah, and with that, I guess Vincent, Vince will have the last question or comment. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Am I we can. muted? Yeah i I would like to just relate some thoughts that that keep occurring over the years. 
when I look back and sort of try to put a framework on 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 this whole thing, and let me just give some of the observations and and then maybe what they point me to. Uh, to go back in history, uh, we have William Miller. And William Miller is a primary figure. He never was an ad, never became an Adventist, but he's he's in the story. Uh, and he is uh, deciding that Christ is coming to earth here uh, on, on some dates. Well, he got some of the dates wrong. Um, and then, as it turns out, uh, in order to salvage this thing, uh, the guy walking through the cornfield actually finally gets an event. And so we bring together and we form this into the sanctuary doctrine when it was really just sort of we stumbled and stumbled and stumbled. And 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 I don't re recall that in all these deliberations or is there a working that Ellen White was much of a figure in this, other than to say that we spent all night in prayer, trying to figure where had we made our mistakes, where was this, and then William Miller was, I think, still calling the shots, and then, of course, the guy, Snow, or whatever it was in the, in the cornfield, and I'm trying to think. If, Hiram Edson. Hiram Edson. Edson. Okay. If God's behind all of this, it seems curious what what is the reason that Ellen White is sort of off to the side until years later ratifying all this. And then if you come forward to today, uh, we are also, I, I watched the uh, Faith and Reason class, we took that poll, like 120 of us, and of the doctrines that, that we continue to hold, the sanctuary doctrine seems to be some of the weakest or least subscribed to doctrines in our church. So I just go back and I see, and then I wonder, is this really the way God works? Is, is this something that I can be very confident that he was there at all these steps when it seems like there was misunderstanding, misunderstanding, misunderstanding? Ellen White's sort of off to the side until years later, trying to bring it all together. I it just I just am uneasy when I'm left with all these questions. And if this is supposed to be something that's so strong that a denomination springs from it, it seems like uh it was one of the more dubious or inauspicious beginnings that God could have uh, used in, in trying to build the remnant church. I, I just have all these questions. I probably don't express them well, but I hope you get the idea of where I'm coming from. Yes, and thank you so much, Vince, for, Vince, for sharing. Thanks so much.